While there are many ecological concerns, there are also, of course, risks to property and infrastructure. We've all seen the pictures of Phragmites that can grow really, really high. So we know that that, you know, impacts shoreline property values. It, it's a problem for access to waterfronts. It creates municipal hazards, um, including problems for drainage, fires, and even visual hazards. Here's just some examples of some loss of recreational opportunities. I think you probably just spoke of one um, in your area. Um, you can see that that's not going to be the same kind of enjoyable experience. Here's a picture I took in Honey Harbor. Um, you can see that this shoreline is completely blocked off. Here's another uh, person whose poor dock is being overwhelmed by Phragmites. So you can see how it affects properties, but it's not just our own individual properties, it's also happening in municipal properties. This happens to be a municipal property that's inundated with Phragmites. Because Phragmites contains so many dead stems, it's also a huge fire hazard. And I mean, you just have to Google this and you can watch lots of videos of uh, Phragmites catching on fire. So that's a real, real danger. This is an unfortunate slide, but um, Talk about a municipal hazard, it's, here it is, it's covering up a fire hydrant, so that's a problem. I've also heard of Phragmites covering stop signs. And finally, I think we alluded this, this, this plant is starting to kind of grow through pavement, which is going to be kind of an issue in terms of cost. It's also uh, an issue for municipal drains. Ken's the drainage superintendent for Kingsville. He got involved in the issue when this tall reed clogged municipal drains and roadside ditches which interfered with farm drainage and crop production. Farmers were losing money because of flooded crops, which means we all lose out. And then there's roads. Uh, we know that uh, Phragmites spreads. It spreads through its 2,000 seeds in its seed head. It spreads through those creepy tentacle crawlers above ground, those stolons. Um, and those can be distributed by wind, and every little bit can kind of create its own plant. It can spread through flowing water and through human interaction. So roads absolutely become a natural and very effective spread vector. I think once you know the plant, you can't help but seeing it, see it everywhere, everywhere that you drive, everywhere that you drive up the highway. So why should we care about roads? Well, we have to be able to stop the spread through the roads or else it's just going to keep coming up to the cottage country or the areas that you particularly love. So it really needs to be stopped. And they're going to talk about that more in the municipal section. So I wanted to speak a little bit about the context for fighting invasive frag. What are international, provincial, and federal governments doing? It's a little bit mind-boggling to try to capture everything that might influence decisions on frag. I think the really key message is that every sector of society has to cooperate and communicate to get rid of this plant. This is a very crowded slide, but I've put a few of the sort of more influential kind of policies or strategies that I saw, and I'm going to talk to just, just three of these. Um, the first one from an international perspective is the 1992 UN Convention on Biological <coughs> Diversity. Canada was actually the first industrialized country to ratify this convention. Under Article 8 of the convention, all signatories are required to prevent the introduction of, control, or eradicate those alien species which threaten ecosystems, habitats, or species. It also called on the signatory countries to develop a national biodiversity strategy, which Canada did in 1995, and Canada has to report every four years to the convention. <coughs> and it's a shared responsibility between provincial, territorial, and federal governments. So I've listed, you know, a couple of kind of policies and things that I think under federal might affect Phragmites. I'm just going to pull out one, and David's already alluded to it which is the ballast water and control regulations. It's probably kind of been the most effective in terms of stopping uh, kind of invasive species. And that required um, ocean-going vessels to flush their t tanks with salt water before entering the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes. And since 2006, as David alluded to, since that was introduced, there have been no new um, aquatic invasive species through that route. Whereas prior to that, they seem to have identified about 34 <laughs> coming in through ocean-going vessels. From a provincial perspective, I'm going to pull out one that I think relates most to Phragmites, and that's the changes to the Public Lands Act in 2014. Changes were made at that time to allow the removal of invasive aquatic plants without a work permit, providing rules were followed. And those are the very rules that you're going to learn today in the community uh, session, which will allow you to do our sel the selective cut method, 
and you'll meet the criteria, which means you do not need a work permit on Crown land. And I'll just say also very briefly, obviously, um, conservation groups, environmental groups, and the First Nations are all vital to the success of the protection of the water and endangered species. I've written down a few of them, um, and a few have spoken today. I will highlight the Ontario Invasive Plan Council, of course. They have a lot of uh, great best management practice guides. But in particular, the Ontario Phragmites Working Group is a committee of the Ontario um, Invasive Plant Council. And they are a real thinking group on Phragmites, and they develop a lot of materials that are very useful. They're a really good resource for m materials and advice. Ducks Unlimited, there's conservation authorities, like we've spoken about today, the Blue Mountain Watershed Trust, of course, and then there's the Georgian Bay Association, GBF, and all kinds of other groups. So you can see that there's a lot of different groups that you can reach out to, and we all need to work together. While these are important, uh, none of it works without individual awareness, knowledge, and support, and understanding what you need to do. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn the microphone over, unless you have any questions, to David to talk about the different methods of controls. So we're using some uh, slides from uh, Dr. Janice Gilbert, who's on the Ontario Phragmites Working Group, um, formerly with the MNR, and many of those pictures that you've seen, some of the worst case uh, Phragmites shots with that uh, long um, survey poll, were actually taken by Janice. She uh, has many years of experience and was gonna speak here, but uh, something came up, and, and so I'm kind of filling in parts of, uh, of this for her. Um, we know we've got to get this plant under uh, control, but this is a case of trying to do the most good with the least harm because uh, we're going into wetlands or we're going into um, sensitive areas and no matter what we do, there, there are going to be potential for collateral uh, damage, but we want to minimize that collateral damage. We know if we don't do anything, the whole wetland is going to be lost anyway, right? So. We need to do something, and uh, we want to do as much as we can. There's lots of people uh, keeping an eye on us out there. So first, the general kind of categorization of controls, uh, biological, mechanical, or chemical. Um, in biological, and when Chris asked the question about you know, this plant coming in and, and uh, coming from other locations, um, it can be grazed on, so cattle, goats, sheep, uh, in fact, the first couple of years that we were cutting, we had uh, an arrangement with a game farm just over near uh, Aurelia to actually take the cut Phragmites. So they would bring a trailer up and load them all up and take them over. And, but of course, they didn't have enough capacity to eat everything that we were cutting. Um, so that's, that's still a significant issue. And we're going to talk about that a little more today, which is the disposal side of things. Um, in Europe, there's like 140 herbivores, you know, insects and... and uh, uh, organisms that will actually eat the plant. Um, there's some research going on on, on you know, what of those we could potentially bring to North America without harming all of the rest of the ecosystem, but I think we could point to numerous occasions where we think we ha understand how these organisms are going to integrate into our ecosystem and we underestimate the potential for the threat side of that equation. So. I think we have to be quite uh, careful when we're looking that way. I'm a biochemist, so the biotechnology side of things always you know, intrigues me, but similarly, unleashing you know, bioweapons to fight this thing could cause significant uh, collateral damage. And so I think we have to be careful there. Um, smothering, drowning, plowing, cutting, it, it doesn't sound very friendly at all, and it's not, but um, there are different techniques that we can use there. And then chemical, and we are gonna talk about chemical, even though in Ontario, there are no overwater herbicides approved. We will still talk about that, and I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on on that front, um, because there may be opportunities here where, or there may be situations here where that's the only way that we can control the plant. So, um, biological, I mentioned that there's some research. There are uh, organisms whose larvae, you know, burrow in and then they pupate right inside of the stock, which just decreases the vigor of the plant and uh, naturally kind of controls it. Um, do you remember, like, when you're younger, the ladybug would crawl on your, right? And you'd just look at it and be like, oh, that's pretty. And now how, when they do that, they bite you? Like, you can actually feel them. Well, that's an example of a Japanese beetle being imported. And uh, it didn't do what the original native uh, ladybird beetle did. 
There are two moths that are identified right now as effective controls that uh, you know, people may consider bringing over, but uh, again, some potential for targeting our native species, which wouldn't help it outcompete the invasive species. So our native Phragmites would, uh, would have some, we would assume, negative impacts based on that biological control vector too. And there's some works uh, you know, being reviewed or, uh, by the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative to kind of see if that's a potential methodology. Um, livestock grazing, cattle, sheep, goats. Um, there was a um, pilot project down in New York State kind of looking at that. And in, uh, in Europe, you know, it's a very common thing as feed for the, uh, the animals over there to have this as uh, a food source. Um, you'll see there the combination of water level control. I'll talk about that when it comes to uh, um, mechanical controls too, flooding and so on. So we can kind of maybe use a, some of these in concert with one another. But here are muskrat um, that are making a nice little uh, den out of the material, harvesting it and using it. And uh, this is in the Lake Huron, uh, uh, Lake Huron coastal wetland. Deer will, uh, will munch on it. In the last workshop that we held, somebody suggested maybe we could come up with a spray that would be like make Phragmites a little more tasty to, to various uh, organisms. So this guy thinks maybe, but we don't have enough deer around to, uh, to you know, really make it an effective dent on this. It may be that organisms, native organisms, start to adapt and, and uh, recognize this as a potential food stuff and start eating it, but birds basically ignore it because the seeds are so tiny, there's not enough calorie in each one. So, you know, it split all of its calories into 2,000 tiny little pieces of fluff. And birds just don't find any uh, benefit to eating that stuff. So There are, is also some investigation going on now with uh, symbiotic control. There's a fungi, a fungus that actually lives in the root system of the plant. And it may help Phragmites be more resistant to uh, drought conditions. It's possible that if we were able to control not the Phragmites, but the fungus, that we could uh, create conditions where the Phragmites then would fail. So take away that symbiotic interrelationship and maybe we'd have some uh, way of controlling this. So just a different angle to take biological control from. If you can't beat the Phragmites, maybe you can beat the other organisms that are helping it. Um, it's also possible potentially to silence the expression of certain genes that create certain proteins. And in the case of Phragmites, it's often that's exactly what an herbicide is going to do chemically. The, the herbicide is going to try to prevent a particular pathway in the organism. But we could selectively do that at the gene level and start looking at uh, potentially creating hybrids of the plant that uh, don't express those allelopathic um, chemicals, for example, that wouldn't create those toxins that are in the root system or that would prevent this plant from having um, the lignans produced in, that it needs to kind of build up its tissues and so on, right? So there are various uh, researchers looking at kind of different things there. The picture was just an example of a corn plant and silencing some of the photosynthetic genes in the corn plant. And you can see the normal one is growing quite prolifically. The gene-silenced corn plant is uh, quite stunted in its growth. And then the mechanical ones that I talked about, so covering or smothering. If you have uh, you know, a four hectare plot, it's kind of hard to imagine being able to effectively do this. But if you've just got a tiny little you know, area on your property or front ditch or something like that, it might be possible. This uh, is the example I mentioned just a minute ago about using things in concert with one another. So actually, being able speci at specific times to cover the plant, drown the, the, uh, the plant area, um, and then at other times of year the water level is low. Um, you can see, you, you make some effect, but all by itself. You, you probably wouldn't find this as the, the control mechanism. You'd do this maybe in concert with things like grazing or other types of uh, controls that you could apply. And then there are mechanical things like plowing or disking where you're physically trying to remove the rhizomes, the actual root of the plant. The problem there is that these things have been documented down like nine or 10 feet. So the amount of work you'd have to do to go down a beach, plow it up, sift all through the cut, uh, remove everything. I mean, it would be quite phenomenal that, uh, that you would be able to actually achieve that. And any little bit that remained behind would be, you know, now just mulched um, cut up into many, it, like doing potatoes, right? Cut the potato up and you plant all the little pieces. 
but you've also now tilled the soil nicely and loosened everything up so it's perfect for growing, right? So it, it, I don't think it's a good uh, control vector. Good business model for some folks. But. Um, and then there's the mechanical cutting. And, uh, and this is one of the ones that we've done on small stands uh, very effectively. And we've got some uh, slides that we'll show too. And Bruce is sitting over here from uh, Lighthouse Point where for the last three, and a, three years, almost four years now, um, they've been out methodically cutting, specifically removing the Phragmites plant year after year after year. It's a lot of hours of work, but it's a very, very effective technique for specifically removing the invasive and leaving all of the other biodiversity there. So all of the other coastal wetland plants are still. Here's uh, mechanical cutting to the extreme, and this is more what they would use over in Europe to actually harvest the plant uh, when they're you know, creating these uh, thatched roofs and stuff. They harvest the reed over there. But this is the same thing, kind of a reciprocating cutter that goes under the ground. Actually, I left the cutter. I'll bring it in after lunch, but the, the cutter that we used, uh, uh, there was one last summer, and now there's about eight that are going to be on the bay this summer. So they're multiplying these cutters, but I'll show you the tool that we used. The problem, obviously, too, with mechanical cutting is, number one, if you're indiscriminate, you're cutting everything, which you don't want to do. And number two is other invasive species. In this picture, for example, the Eurasian water milfoil, every little bit of it that floats off can re-root and grow. So, you know, you may inadvertently end up spreading invasive species instead of controlling invasive species through these techniques. So you have to be very selective. Burning, Heather showed you uh, a picture previously. Um, this would typically be done after you rolled the plant material. So you would roll it down, um, flatten it, and then you'd let it dry out, and then you'd burn it. Um, you obviously need the right people to be there and oversee this kind of work. But in cases where you've got you know, multiple hectares of, uh, of plant material, you want to remove as much of that biomass as you can, and burning may be effective. In other situations, uh, you know, there's the proximity of, uh, of buildings um, or property that you don't want to damage, like may just render that too risky, and, and you wouldn't have it available in the arsenal of, uh, of controls. Also, in some respects, you've got to remember that this is a grass, and grasses are used to surviving burns. And if you've got rhizomes that are down even you know, six inches below the ground, those rhizomes are going to survive. And so you do get plant material that comes back up if burning was your only control. But removing all of that biomass could also uh, you know, minimize risks to uh, public property. And so just from a fire safety control side of things, it might be an important thing to, uh, to put in the arsenal of controls too. And as I mentioned, this complementary control where not just one but multiple uh, controls are brought to bear is ideally the best way of doing it. Whether you're, you're cutting the plant out and physically removing it or burning it, the idea initially is to get rid of this thatch, the thick, heavy biomass that exists, because even that thatch inhibits other native plants from regrowing in the uh, location. And if that thatch is in the water, as I mentioned earlier, the waters will go anoxic because of all the decay that's happening there. And so that just changes all of the water chemistry too. And minor changes in water chemistry can have significant changes to the actual you know, metals and, or other uh, nutrients that get into the water column. Um, for example, anoxic water is perfect breeding ground for toxic uh, blue-green algae blooms, right? If we eliminate the water or the oxygen in the water, then these um, uh, toxins can be released. And I mentioned already the, the Toledo problem where half a million people lost their drinking water become, because of that. So we do want to try to restore the native ecosystem back to what it was so that it can respond and react normally. But you can see the rolled um, example here and then first year growth. You can see the new growth only sticking up now, but all of that old mass of uh, material is still there, very thick. That's a snake uh, catching a frog in it, but um, we want to try to remove that thatch, that, that mass. And then chemical. And of course, chemical comes with its own array of uh, issues. In spraying, we sometimes have overspraying. And here's an example of uh, a train that's uh, spraying an herbicide to keep the rail tracks clear, which is a safety issue for them, <laughs> but not bothering to shut off the sprayer when they got to a wetland and just spraying right through the wetland. This is down in Erie in the US. And in, in the US, some of these chemicals are actually authorized for overwater use, but not always 
the chemical that sprays the rest of the track. It'd be two different versions of the, the, uh, pest or the herbicide that would be used. The, the most kind of intimate way of chemical control would be injecting each stem, right, with a, with a chemical. Um, in some cases, the best injectable is just vinegar, which is now, like, you know, not even toxic to the rest of the environment. So if you had a small area that you were trying to control, um, you know, maybe that's an option, but uh, it can be a lot of work. But you can see the effect of it. If we can inject that chemical into the plant, you, you, with chemicals, you have to get a certain coverage of the plant for it to absorb a certain number of grams of the chemical, right? If we inject that plant, we can put a lot more chemical into the plant than we could if we just spray the leaf and cover the leaf with a, a, you know, a fine mist. And you can see when we can inject the plant that that uh, toxin is translocated underground through the root systems and actually is killing Phragmites well outside of the plot of injected plant. If you just did a spray, you might not find that because you actually don't end up with enough of the chemical being absorbed into the plant for it to translocate through the root system. And there's research being done on this right now. Uh, I was just speaking with uh, a researcher from Waterloo that uh, we might do a little bit of a research study with this summer on you know, how, much, how much can you get on the plant um, to actually be translocated through the root system. If you don't do that, tr um, that uh, you know, control at that specific density, then you have to make sure that you're spraying everything everywhere and you're not missing anything. In the United States, there are chemicals. The glyphosate and imazapyr are the two main chemicals that are used for Phragmites control. I mentioned earlier in response to the, the question there that the BASF uh, approval in Canada just came around for power line two. They use two slightly different pathways in the plant to turn off different proteins, like the, the toxin works in slightly different ways. But in the US, there's approval for those to be applied over water. They can apply them aerially, and they're spending right now about four million a year controlling about 90,000 dish hectares. On the Canadian side, basically the same products, the, the glyphosate and the Arsenal Powerline product, which is the Imazapyr product. We in Canada also have to have approval of the surfactant that you apply with the herbicide. You, if you just apply the herbicide, you can imagine it beading on the plant. You need the surfactant in order for it to kind of break that surface tension and be absorbed into the plant leaf. But neither of those chemicals, as of now, is approved for use over the water. So if you have a wet area, you're not supposed to apply the chemical at all. So roadside ditches typically are dry. You know, we're able to spray the roadside with these to control. But uh, your coastal wetland that's wet, typically you wouldn't be able to apply these. They're a pond situation. The chemicals are non-specific. So they'll kill a plant. Any plants in the water would die, even our native plants. And so a lot of research right now, and again, I mentioned the University of Waterloo, but some of the research they're looking at is the succession years. So how do our native species actually come back? How does the seed bank actually um, you know, respond? So that the new plants that now start to germinate in year two, do they actually grow? And do they thrive? And can they come back selectively? And I'll tell you, at this point, the research seems to indicate that Phragmites sprouts just as nicely in year two as it did in year one, but um, it still might be a good thing. And of course, these chemicals you can't use uh, um, cosmetically, so any ap applicators would need to be licensed and uh, approved, and municipalities would have their uh, contractors that they, they work with in order to do this. If you're going to uh, look at applying the chemical, outside of its normal bounds, you'd have to go to the MNR and get a uh, written opinion. And also there's the uh, Canadian federal government would have to have a, an authorization there. There's some work right now to try to uh, get a special dispensation to allow this chemical to be used over water in a test site so that we can actually see what the actual um, in situ impacts of this are. And the Ontario Phragmites Working Group is kind of leading that, uh, that request. They just sent a, a letter to the uh, Premier asking that to be speeded up a little bit because as of this date in Ontario, there are no 
chemical tools that can be used for Phragmites control um, in wet areas. Uh, the other piece of paper that uh, you have to comply with is the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs has a guide to weed control and they actually show specifications on different types of chemicals. I, I, there's no test on this later on. Uh, it's available online and we'll post it on our website too. But it does talk about you know, the chemical and what you can uh, use it for and what precautions you have to take in order to apply any chemical for any type of uh, plant that you're controlling. And this is a very extensive uh, document. This is page 429. Um, it doesn't start at page one. It, this is kind of the appendix, but uh, there's lots of pages to go through and licensed applicators have to know all of this kind of uh, information. There's work done in the United States out of uh, Michigan Tech where they actually, in Green Bay, did some testing on how to control the plant. I, the most successful thing was to do all of the work in an area all at the same time so that you don't then end up with seed banks or repositories reinfesting subsequent years. Um, and in other studies, what they did is just try to, you know, control some of it and then see what happened to the other periphery and how quickly it kind of was reinfested. So there's a lot of work that they've done um, scientifically just trying to, you know, really figure these things out quantitatively. And I mentioned the uh, University of Waterloo already. There's some documentation on actual, uh, you know, years of controls, 40 years of different types of outcomes around Fra Phragmites astralis. And, and what it in general shows is that cuts are great as a, you know, rapid response. They can reduce domination immediately. They can allow native species to kind of come back and, uh, and regrow in the same location. And this is what we've applied in our cutting in Georgian Bay. When we're in the water, because we don't have any other way of doing it, we've been selective in how we've cut. And immediately you can see, as we cut in uh, at Lighthouse Point, you could literally see the native uh, biodiversity just re-emerging as we removed the stalks of Phragmites. And within maybe a couple of weeks, uh, even some of the wildlife was coming back in. In fact, the day we were cutting, we were seeing all the frogs coming back out of the Phragmites bank and stuff like that. So, um, but bringing birds back in, you know, we can start to see that. With herbicides, um, some of them, like the Amazapir, you apply it this year, it actually doesn't have any real impact until the second year, like until the following year. Um, with the glyphosate, you can see it kind of a little more immediate in the way that it reacts. But it may take some time, and it may take multiple applications of the, uh, the chemical in order to have some impacts. However, when you're dealing with large areas, anybody that was in the water cutting last year knows, <laughs> it's a labor-intensive uh, labor intensive kind of job. And if you've got, uh, you know, a 10-hectare site, the, the odds of getting out there with, uh, you know, a well-intentioned community, uh, it, it's difficult, right? Honey Harbor, the cutting there, lots of people, lots of work. Um, it's hard to, to remove the material. So it's effective, but it is uh, time consuming. And again, the idea is to try to, to select these things specifically so that we do the, the most good with the least harm. Timing is critical, not just because of the biology of the plant itself, but also because it's in the ecosystem and various you know, fish are in the uh, the wetlands, using it for nursery habitat or, you know, laying eggs. You don't want to be in there working when those processes are going on. Or birds are nesting. You don't want to be in the wetlands scaring away all the birds that are nesting at that particular time of year. Um, or pupating or using this for, you know, so there, there are selective times throughout the year when we want to be in the field doing this work and other times where we wouldn't. And that's typically when you would have had to get your work orders from MNRs, depending on what the work was that you were doing they would know what was happening in the, the water and be able to instruct you on when that type of work could or could not be done, right? So without the need for the work permit, we want to make sure that we're educating people on the timing for when you would go ahead and do these cuts. Water levels can have a significant impact. When we had these years of low water levels through Georgian Bay, Phragmites would get established and then, you know, three years later as water was coming up, the established Phragmites plants, they don't just automatically drown they're still thriving and growing and, and uh, you know, not having too much trouble. Here was a case in 2012 up in Honey Harbor. And uh, three years later, that uh, growth was in the water when the water levels were up. This was kind of looking back the other direction. But uh, 
we had a great crew in there and some young folks come out and help us and that one only took us a uh, better part of a morning, I think, that part, right? So, and here's down in the, the Collingwood cut where we had uh, a, a significant number of volunteers last year uh, show up and pulled out uh, on that day about two tons from this one specific uh, wetland. Um, and high winds, if you were gonna you know, have an applicator, a chemical applicator come in and actually look at, uh, at putting chemical on a particular stand, um, you know, you have to be aware of the high winds and wind carriage and all that kind of stuff too. So the municipal, uh, you know, sprayers are going to have to think about that more. You don't want this being sprayed over a non-resistant crop. The method of application really has to suit the situation. Um, the, the method of uh, treatment, if you're in a coastal wetland, you're not going to be applying chemical if you're in Canada. If you're in a, uh, you know, a roadside ditch, you're not going to be trying to muster volunteers to come out and cut miles and miles and miles of ditch. We have to apply the right tool in the right circumstance and we want to talk today about kind of developing those work plans and uh, making those decisions. The Ontario Phragmites Working Group and the Ontario Invasive Plant Council have a workbook that we'll talk about um, that will allow municipal or community groups to go through a process to, uh, to identify, um, map out, the stand and then develop the actual specific treatment programs that should be used there and then put in place the follow-up and the monitoring that's important for this too because we need to have our control methodology uh, evaluated as to its effectiveness so that the, the following year we know if it's working or not and if we should continue.